Hey, Christina, can you hear us? Yes. Great. I think we're ready to start, so I'll pass over to you. Okay, uh, for us in Sweden, it is good morning, four o'clock in the morning, and uh, I am sharing a session on mind seismicity, and we are having three papers today, and we are starting with the reliable automatic processing of seismic events, solving the Swiss cheese problem. And the presenter will be Jesper Martinsson, and he is an Associated Professor of Mathematical Statistics at Lund University, and is also a senior researcher at LKB. Please, Jesper, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Christina, for the, for the introduction. Yes, uh, reliable automatic processing of seismic events, solving the Swiss cheese problem. Uh, so we're going to talk uh, a lot about cheese today. I hope uh, you don't mind. Um, so uh, my co-author is uh, Ville Törnman, and he's a PhD student uh, at the university and also a research engineer at, at LKB. So I'm going to talk about something called BEMIS. It's short for Bayesian Estimation of Mining Induced Seismicity. It's a fully automatic, close to real time, and it's also a self-learning seismic processing solution for mining induced seismic events. So basically it's a automatic processing platform or package. It's a collection of research results that has been conducted over many years at LKB and also in collaboration with the university. And the main goal is to trying to replace or at least minimize manual processing as much as possible. And today uh, I'm, I'm going to present some investigations of, 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 uh, of the challenges with manual processing, but uh, I'm also going to summarize some results uh, and comparison to auto processing using our package BMS. So just a, a quick background um, for those of you who are not familiar with it, this, but um, um, the challenges we have is that the excavation creates uh, seismic events and it could be violent ejection of rock that can cause damages to the mine, production stop, but also accidents. So the mine takes a number of actions. In the short term, uh, we try to evacuate areas subjected to a large event or if the activity increases. Medium term actions are trying to ask them the question, when is it safe to go back to mine, uh, basically. And long-term action is to understand the relationship between mining and uh, induced seismicity. This is just a, a short summary of, of, of actions. Uh, but to do this, we need two things. We need a seismic measurement system. Uh, and I think we're going to hear a little bit more about this in, in the next presentation, if I'm correct. Uh, but we also need seismic processing service. And this is what I'm going to talk to you about today. So the processing can either be done manually or automatically or a mixture of both. So what is uh, seismic processing? Well, it's all about estimating important parameters of the event, or it could be many events in, in, in combination. But I, I try to keep it simple just for this presentation. So we're trying to estimate parameters of the event given the measured data at our sensors. So the body wave travel from the event and arrive at a sensor. And we try to estimate, first of all, the arrival times, but there are more we estimate from, from the measurements. Um, but just to keep it simple, um, let's look at the arrival times. This is uh, an example of how a measurement can look like at the sensor. So you have, first of all, the pressure wave, oh, sorry, the measurement noise. And then you have the arrival of the pressure wave. And then you have the arrival of the shear wave. 
The pressure wave can be estimated either using automatic algorithms as, as the one we have, or it could be estimated manually by picking, uh, clicking with your mouse where, where the uh, arrival of the P wave is. But when you use automatic algorithms, if you zoom into this little gray box, you're gonna get uh, the algorithm will return a distribution of the arrival time. So it's not just a number, but a distribution of likely arrival times. So the bar here is the most likely arrival time, and then you have the distribution around it. And, and if the distribution is wide, it means that the arrival is difficult to, to estimate. It's the uncertainty. And similarly for the shear arrival time, if you, if you uh, zoom into this gray box, you're gonna get the distribution of the, of the arrival times for the shear, shear wave. The arrival time itself is equal to the travel time plus the origin time. Uh, so the time we arrived is simply when we started plus the time it took to travel there. And the travel time is governed by very simple physics. It's just the distance divided by the velocity for that, for that wave type. So what we have is we have a number of sensors we have many arrival times, and from these arrival times, we can estimate the source. Uh, or actually, if you're interested in location, we can estimate X, Y, Z, and T0, which are the unknowns for, for estimating the location. But this is, however, under the assumption that the propagation medium is homogeneous, and we have straight path, straight rays from from the event to the sensors. And this might be an okay assumption if sensors are at uh, a long distance from the source. But in a mine, you typically have a situation that kind of looks like this. So instead of having that sort of situation, we will have something like, like this for the, for the, for the rays. And also the, the yellow part in here is not the same cheese. So we can have a little bit of, if, if you look at this, this red uh, propagation path from the event to this sensor, uh, we can have a little bit of maybe mozzarella cheese. We can have some goat cheese, some cream cheese, which might represent the, the clay zones we have in, in Kiruna, but it may also propagate through some hard cheese like Parmesan or Manchego or something like that. Um, so we have different kinds of cheese in this yellow part, uh, which affects uh, the, the, the measurement. Uh, and here's an example of that. Here, here's a, a tomographic image uh, or tomographic slice through an ore body in Malmberget. And the colors, you can see the different types of cheese around this uh, or body. And this is uh, tomographic images you can get out of this automatic platform. Um, so we have different kinds of cheese affecting the both the velocities along this ray, but also the ray path. Um, so this arrival time, he, this, this sensor here assumes that the event happened maybe somewhere here because of the unknowns. Um, and that sensor over here assumes that the event happened somewhere here. So looking at all sensors, you can get data that do not overlap. There are inconsistent data. So it's difficult to solve, for example, the, the location because you have data telling different stories. But also the, ener the energy is different for the same reasons. So if you estimate the energies, uh, using it, for example, for Richter, Richter magnitudes, uh, it's also difficult. And the angle of arrivals will be different. So if you look at first arrivals and, and the angles for those, uh, they are going to be different compared to a homogeneous medium with straight paths. And this affects moment tensors. And 
we also have site effects, uh, which are also frequency dependent. And it doesn't stop there. We have mining noises that contaminates our data. We have drilling, excavation noises of different kinds, blast, etc. So here we have, for example, a seismogram, which has been contaminated with some drilling noise that you can see. Uh, manual picking, maybe just throw this seismogram away, but with automatic algorithms, you can actually go uh, and, and produce uh, a likely P arrival. Although in this case, you might have two likely P arrivals. It could be either here or it could be either here. And the same goes for the S arrival here. So you'll have a, a quite wide distribution uh, telling us that it's a bit uncertain. So it's, it's downweighted in, 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 in the subsequent analysis. So this is, uh, doesn't even stop here. We also have uh, multiple events that contaminates our data. So if the association fails, you might uh, end up with uh, a seismogram that looks like this. So you have two events in the same measurement window. So you can have a P arrival that comes from this uh, burst, or you can have a P arrival that comes from this. So these are um, the reality. And this is the model that we assume that the data comes from. And this mismatch between reality and the model creates a lot of outliers. And these outliers, how do we deal with that? Uh, well, we use often manual processing. And with manual processing, we remove outliers. So that will remove a couple of those stars. We also try to adjust arrival times. That will also remove a couple of stars or make the stars more aligned. Uh, and we also truncate data. So we look at only the closest sensors and that might also remove a couple of stars. So we get a, a, a single solution here. So I'm going to focus a little bit more about the truncation of data here. So this is uh, an image from, from this summer. This is one month in July, um, the events in, in Kiruna. And each dot represents an event and the dots are colored in, in magnitude here, local scale. And on the Y axis here, you see sensors used when, when processing the event. So we are auto processing, we use all the sensors here. And for example, this event here happened on July the 3rd and we have 110 uh, sensors that is used to, to process that event when you do auto processing. But when you do manual processing, you truncate the events. So you use, for example, in Kirin and Malmberg, we have a setting uh, so that we use only the first 18 uh, arrivals or sensors. So this, this is a significant loss of information going from this type of situation to that type of situation uh, by tr truncating the data. And why do we truncate the data? Well, first of all, we only have a limited human resources available. So we like to look at only the, the closest sensors um, that will reduce the amount of processing that has to be done. But also we hope that the closest sensors are more important. For example, if you look at this type of situation, so we have an event that happened somewhere here in, this, in, the, in the cheese. Um, and if you look at only the closest sensor, we hope that that will follow our modeling assumption of homogeneous medium and, uh, and, uh, and straight uh, paths. So why do we adjust arrivals? Well, we hope that it will give you more consistent arrivals and we will compensate for extreme values. And why remove outliers? Well, it's basically for the same reason. We try to remove extreme values, but also mining noises that contaminates our data. 
but all these three techniques are not really in line with good modeling practice. Uh, so from a modeling point of view, we should not adapt reality to our model. That is one of the, the big no-nos when, when, when we are teaching modeling from the university at least. So we are not supposed to, to uh, tamper with the data in any way. So if we need to adjust or truncate or remove data for our model to work, then basically our model is not able to describe the observations we have. And a consequence of that is the conclusions drawn based on the model are questionable. So locations are questionable, magnitudes are questionable and so on. So we'll return a little bit to this uh, later on in this presentation. So going from this situation with all the data to this situation where we have truncated data, our, the main reason is that we have a too simple model. So I will return to this picture. So what happens if we remove outliers with just arrivals and we truncate the data and, and it's not good enough for, for, for the mine? Um, so what if the mine is not happy with the result? Then we apply manual reprocessing. So a different person is going to process the event uh, and hopefully uh, the reprocessing will be, we make the mine happy. So someone else will, will adjust the arrival times, truncate the data, remove outliers, and hopefully that will result in a different uh, result that, uh, that is okay with the mine. So one question that we try to ask is that, what effect has reprocessing on, on the result? So, um, in Kiruna and Malmberg, for example, the largest, most significant events are routinely sent for manual reprocessing as a, just as a precaution, like a second opinion. And if we document the relocation after each reprocessing, we can draw some conclusions of the effect of reprocessing. So in this file, we have data roughly over two years in Kiruna. And that results in 1,200 events with magnitude above one, above or equal one. And out of which, well, not really half, but 500 events have documented coordinates after reprocessing. And this is just because we, we didn't have time to fill every, document every, every event. So 500 is, is documented with coordinates uh, after reprocessing. And looking at the relocation of the largest events in Kiruna after manual reprocessing, we get this picture. This is seen from the hanging wall side in Kiruna. So uh, uh, here the red dots are the coordinate of the one processing and the line to the next dot is the relocation of that event due to reprocessing that with another, another human. So someone else has been doing the adjustments of the arrivals and, and picking the out, removing the outliers and truncating the data. And the line, the length of that line is the distance moved uh, due to relocation. And what we can see here is that we have different clusters. We have movement within clusters, but we also have movement between two clusters. And this is mainly in, in Kiruna, this is because we have a porous, porous sensor configuration at this location. Uh, so when we have only 18 sensors, when we do manual processing, it's really sensitive to what uh, arrivals you, you include in that analysis and what you remove. So that makes this mirroring effect where the event jumps between two different clusters. So if we, analysis, if, we, if we do an analysis of just the moved distance due to reprocessing, you get this histogram. So here you have the moved distance from zero to 2.5 kilometers. And here we have all the number of events 
um, 500 in total. So this is uh, the, the move distance between MAN and reprocessing. And you can do some statistics on this. So you can say that a large event in Kirna moves on average a distance of 322 meters due to reprocessing. So this is the, the most important events for Kirna and, and what happens when you apply, when you apply different uh, manual processing on, on the same event. So if you need to, I will return to this, this uh, square. So if you need to adjust or temper your data, then our model is not able to describe the observations and conclusions drawn based on the model are questionable. So here, the conclusions might be the location. So just by doing this differently, you get a totally different location um, of where the event happened. So let's look at the, uh, the solution to the Swiss, Swiss cheese problem. Uh, what can we do to, to solve this? Um, so <clears throat> I will return to this picture. And, and the first thing we can do is that we can try to add uncertainties and, and statistics to this model. You have five so, minutes, Jesper. Yeah, thanks. So uh, going from this location to that location, uh, just because we don't know the unknowns here, we have different velocities, different propagation paths. But if we add the uncertainties in arrival times, uncertainties in distance, uncertainties in velocities, you can actually squeeze out this a little bit more. And if you look at this arrival time, uh, you will squeeze that out as well, and so on. So you get uh, different weightening for different uh, arrivals. And now data starts to overlap. So we go from something like this to something like this by adding statistics and uncertainties. And you, from now on, we can, we can actually use all the sensors. We don't have to truncate anything. And by applying self-calibration, we can remove systematic errors. So we go from something like that to something like that. And then the more we process, the better it becomes. So this is a self-learning model. So it's, it will start to learn how the cheese looks the more it processes. I will come into that a little bit later on. Uh, so let's look at, at, at some um, analysis here. Uh, so here we have 290 blasts uh, with known coordinates that we can evaluate the, just the location. So if you look at manual processing in Kiruna, we have 229 of those blasts are in Kiruna. We have a, an average of 51 meters, 52 meters uh, with manual processing. And if you apply statistics with self-learning techniques, you will reduce it to 14 meters. Um, the same, almost the same looks for, for we have for Malmberg, we have 61 blasts, we go from 48 meters with manual processing down to 11 meters. And the standard deviation are also reduced significantly. So this is a factor seven, and this is a factor five uh, for the standard deviation, which indicate that precision is much better. So that's for, for blasts with known coordinates. But if you look at data, we have a picture that kind of looks like this. We have a, uh, I think it's 19 days of data here uh, in Kiruna. So this is with manual processing. And if we go to um, auto processing, it will look something like this. So if I flicker back and forth here, you might see the difference in, in when you look at real data. So you can see the ore pass is getting much clearer here. Oh, sorry. Um, and and the, the clusters have much more, are getting contracted compared to manual processing. So um, solving the Swiss cheese. So <clears throat> let's continue. Uh, this actually also increases the sensitivity of the system because we're using all the data and we're using Bayesian statistics. And this can also be seen when, when investigating the data. So here we have in Malmö at the picture where we have the manual processing here to the left and to the right you have 
automatic processing using the same data over the same time period. So we can actually detect up to six times more events using the same input data. Just because you're using all the sensors and you're using Bayesian statistics. Um, so uh, you will go from something like this. And if you apply statistics and uh, self calibration, you will end up with something like this. So um, I'm going to just go into the self calibration part a little bit and look at the internals of, of, of this automatic platform. Um, so uh, the self calibration part, then each sensor is learning how the surrounding lock, rock looks like. Um, so here we have a sensor in the middle. You have the uh, picture of how the, the surrounding rock looks like in terms of P wave velocities. Here you have a picture in terms of the arrival angles compared to a homogeneous medium. And here you have two different uh, internals of how the sensor is seeing the, the rock in terms of the energies or the attenuation of the energies. And you have this type of scenario in Kirina for these two sensors. But you can read a little bit more about this in the, in the paper. So just to summarize, um, by solving the Swiss cheese, we get a valid model that is capable of describing all the measurements. We can actually use all the data without tempering it in any way. It's full automatic compared to manual processing. It gives four times more accurate locations, 40 times faster processing time that also scales with computer power. You can detect six times more events given the same data. And um, you get reliable auto processing. And this is the future for seismic monitoring. No human limitations. It scales with computer power. You can have significantly more sensors than today's system. In Kirna, we have something that looks like this. And this is on the limit of human capabilities. But you can actually have maybe something that looks like this, that just scales with more computers. And uh, looking at the self calibration part, we have data that uh, uh, is uh, compensating for angle of arrivals, velocities, attenuations, energies, etc. From those data, you can actually create tomographic images. This is one from Boole Eden, one from Malmberget, and you can slice it in different ways. You have to round up, Kisper. Okay, thank you. That's actually that's actually it. So. Okay. So thank you for listening. And if you are interested in trying the automatic processing in, in your mind, please contact either me or Ville at these addresses and, and we can maybe set this up for you. Thank you. <laughs>